Gomery cuts were introduced by Ralph Gomery in his 1958 paper, and this was a major theoretical breakthrough at that time. And for the next couple of decades, these methods were largely considered to be of theoretical value. But this gradually changed, and by the end of 90s, it wouldn't be exaggeration to say that uh, the cutting plane methods became uh, the single most important factor contributing to the success of modern commercial solvers for mixed integer programs. I will illustrate the ideas of Gomery cuts using this simple two-dimensional example. In this example, we have the following formulation. Maximize x1 plus x2. So you have the isoprofit line uh, shown here on the plot. And the constraints would be 4x1 plus 7x2 is less than or equal to 28. And 2x1 minus 2x2 is less than or equal to 3. Both variables are non-negative and are required to be integer. So we can see that uh, this formulation is clearly not perfect. In, in an ideal formulation, this is what we want to have. So we would like to have the LP relaxation to coincide with the convex hull of the feasible points which are integer. However, we rarely have this in practice. Perfect formulations are not easy to come up with. But this is what we are trying to achieve. So we try to improve the quality of the formulation by adding the cutting planes. All right, returning to our formulation, the optimal solution for our problem is located uh, in this corner right here. And clearly it's uh, not integer. So in fact, the x2 value is integer, but x1 is non-integer. Now, what we're going to do, we will look at the basis corresponding to this uh, optimal solution. So for this, let's recall how we solve the problem using the simplex method. In the simplex method, the first step we start with is uh, converting the inequality constraints into equality constraints by introducing the slack variables. So we have the slack variable S1 for the first constraint and S2 for the second constraint. And then the relation between the basic and non-basic variables would be XB is given by B inverse times B minus B inverse times N times XN. So where B is the matrix consisting of the columns corresponding to the basic variables and n is the matrix consisting of the columns corresponding to the non-basic variables. To derive a Gomery cut, we will need information from the simplex tableau. So we go ahead and compute all this data using the octave. So this is a free analog of MATLAB that's accessible online. We can see that b inverse times b is given by 7 halves and 2. And at this point, note that our matrix B is given by the first two columns here because X1 and X2 are clearly the basic variables in our optimal solution. So therefore, B is given by this matrix right here. And uh, N is given by the identity matrix that corresponds to the slack variables. So therefore, B inverse times N is the same as B inverse. Since x2 is already integer in the optimal solution to the current LP relaxation, we don't need to worry about it. And instead, we need to focus our attention on uh, the x1 variable. So therefore, we are going to write a part of the simplex tableau that corresponds to x1. So we'll get the data from uh, this picture here. According to this uh, result, we have here x1 is equal to b inverse times b part corresponding to x1 is given by 7 halves. And then uh, the part corresponding to b inverse times n will be located in the first row of this matrix here, inverse of b. Recall that n is the identity matrix, so b inverse times n is the same as just b inverse. And also our non-basic variables at the optimal solution 
are given by S1 and S2. Therefore, this gives you the coefficient for S1 and this is the coefficient for S2. As a result, we have minus 1 eleventh S1 minus 7 over 22 S2. All right, before we proceed, observe that whenever we have a feasible integer solution to this LP relaxation here, x1 and x2 must be integer, and then the coefficients for x1 and x2 are integer in both equations, and we have the integer right-hand sides. As a result, whenever you have an integer feasible solution to this LP relaxation, s1 and s2 must also be integer. So, to proceed, we rearrange the terms in this equation by moving all the variables to the left. This is what you would typically have in the simplex tableau representation. So you'll have uh, this expression right here. And now I look at uh, the coefficients for S1 and S2. Because S1 and S2 are non-negative variables, if I replace these coefficients with smaller ones, the expression on the left will only become less. So therefore, we can write down the following. So x1 plus, and then round down of 1 11th is going to be 0. So we'll have a 0 coefficient for s1. A round down for 7 over 22 is also 0. As a result, we only have x1 remaining on the left. And this must be now less than or equal to 7 halves. Now, for any feasible integer solution, obviously we can uh, strengthen this inequality by rounding the right-hand side down. So from here, we can write down that x1 is uh, less than or equal to the floor of 7 halves, which is 3. So, we produce the inequality x1 is less than or equal to 3. And obviously, this inequality will hold for all the integer points contained uh, in the polyhedral set representing the feasible solution to the LP relaxation. Because the way we derived it, no integer points can be cut off. Clearly, all inequalities we have here must be satisfied by all integer solutions. Therefore, we can add this inequality x1 less than or equal to 3 to our problem without cutting off any feasible solutions to our integer program. So we go ahead and add this constraint x1 is less than or equal to 3. And obviously, the new integer program that we obtained is equivalent to the previous one we just got a tighter formulation for the original problem because we cut off a part of the feasible region of LP relaxation that was irrelevant for our IP. So now looking at this LP relaxation, the new one, we see that the optimal solution is going to be located uh, at this point right here. And let's try to determine what uh, basic, non-basic variables we have uh, in this corner. So first of all, we can see that x1 is positive, x2 is positive. So x1 and x2 must be the basic variables. Uh, and then uh, the third basic variable, because now we have three inequality constraints, so we must have three basic variables. The third basic variable will be given by the slack variable for the inactive constraint at our optimal point. And this inactive constraint is uh, the second constraint here. So therefore, the basic variables will be x1, x2, and s2, the slack variable corresponding to the second uh, constraint. Next, what we are going to do, we are going to build the matrix B capital, which will consist of the columns corresponding to the basic variables. So the columns will be 4, 2, 1, 7, 2, 0 and then 0, 1, 0. Then the matrix corresponding to the non-basic variables, matrix N, will consist of two columns corresponding to the slack variables of the first and the third uh, constraint. 
and we are going to compute the new basic feasible solution that is optimal right now. Again, we use uh, Octav and we get uh, the following solution. So inverse of B times B small is given by 3, 16 seventh and 11 seventh. And clearly we have the integer value for x1 and non-integer value for x2. And what we are going to focus on is this non-integer value. So you can see that x1 is equal to 3 in the optimal solution here. And we saw that x2 is equal to 16 seventh. So x2 and b inverse times n and given in this uh, matrix right here. So And we are focusing on the second row of this matrix. So it's going to be given by... First of all, B inverse times B component corresponding to X2 is uh, 16 seventh. And uh, then minus B inverse times uh, N times XN will correspond to minus 1 seventh. Then the first non-basic variable was uh, S1. And then plus 4 seventh, the second basic variable was S3. And then we are going to do the same thing we did uh, before. So we'll move everything to the left. So we'll have x2 plus 1 seventh s1. Then uh, the round down for minus 4 seventh is going to be negative 1. So we'll have x2 minus s3 is going to be less than or equal to 16 seventh. And uh, once again, observing that both x2 and s3 must be integer in any solution that would be feasible to our IP, we can actually round down the right-hand side uh, to obtain a valid inequality. So the valid inequality that we obtain is x2 minus s3 is less than or equal to 2. Okay, so now we need to express this inequality in terms of the original variables, S3 is a slack variable, so if I want to update my IP model with a tighter one that, that has a tighter LP relaxation, I need to go ahead and replace S3 with the expression for it. Uh, so S3 would be the slack variable corresponding to uh, the third uh, constraint here that we added on the previous step, and we can see that S3 is given by 3 minus x1. So therefore, we will reformulate this by saying that s3 is equal to 3 minus x1. And this is equivalent to x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 5. So this is the new valid inequality that we produced on this step. So next we are going to add this cut to our previous uh, model. So we go ahead and add the new cut. Looking at the figure for LP relaxation we obtain after adding this new cut, we can see that now the LP relaxation has two alternative optimal solutions at extreme points and of course in infinitely many in between. But we can see that one of the optimal solutions is now integer. x1 is equal to 3 and x2 is equal to 2. And uh, if our implementation of the simplex method finds uh, this of the two corner optimal solutions then we are done and we don't need to continue. But we'll assume that our simplex implementation ends up finding this uh, optimal solution. And uh, we can see that now it's fractional both for x1 and x2. So uh, then we need to add more Gomery cuts in order to cut off this infeasible solution for our IP. We proceed as before by first identifying the basic variables and uh, expressing the basic variables through the non-basic. Now B, the set of basic variables is x1, x2, and then we can see that the constraints that are inactive at this point for which we have the positive slack variables 
this will be the second constraint and uh, the third constraint. So the second and the third constraints, their slack variables will be in the basis. So S2, S3 are the basic variables. And then again, we go to the octave and uh, compute the expressions that we need. Both x1 and x2 are fractional, and we need to decide uh, for which variable we are going to apply the Gomery cut. Let's take x1, let's say x1 is going to be equal to 7 thirds. So x1 is taken from here, and then uh, the remaining parts will be taken from this matrix, plus one third and the non-basic variables were S1 and S4. Again, rearranging and doing rounding we obtain and uh, rounding down the right hand side we obtain a tighter inequality X1 minus S1 plus 2 S4 is less than or equal to 2. Okay, so now we need to express S1 and S4 through X1 and X2 in order to obtain an inequality for our model. Substituting for S1 and S4 in this inequality right here, we obtain X1 minus 28 minus 4 X1 minus 7 X2 plus 2 5 minus x1 minus x2 less than or equal to 2. So the coefficient for x1 is 1 plus 4 minus 2, which is 3. And the coefficient for x2 would be 7 minus 2. And this is less than or equal to negative 28 plus 10 negative 18 and then moving it to the right we get 20. So this is the valid inequality that we eventually produce which will add to the previous uh, IP model to obtain a tighter LP relaxation. This uh, valid inequality will cut off the previous optimal solution to the LP relaxation but there will still be alternative optima that are non-integer. And to see this, we can just plug in the integer optimal solution into the left-hand side. So x1 is equal to 3, x2 is equal to 2, and we'll obtain 19, which is less than 20. So clearly this cut doesn't pass through the optimal point, and uh, it's not going to cut off all the fractional optima. Therefore, let's try to apply the Gomery cut also for x2 in addition to x1 and see if it will get the job done and will obtain a unique optimal solution which is integer. So, we proceed to octave again. In case of x2, we are looking at these parts right here. So, x2 plus one third s1 minus four thirds So we obtain the following valid inequality. And it is easy to check that the corresponding line passes through the point 32, which as we already know is one of the optima for our problem and in fact uh, the only integer optimum. So next we are going to compare the last two valid inequalities that we generated. First we'll look at the cut that was obtained uh, using x1. So this is the first uh, Gomery cut that we generated in the last step. And we can clearly see that it only cuts off a tiny little region slightly above this red line. 
and we can see that there are still infinitely many optimal solutions here, only one of which is integer, so the other corner is clearly non-integer. However, when we do the second cut, which we generated using the variable x2, then we see that it passes through the points 0, 4 and 3, 2, and it cuts off this uh, part of the feasible region that contained all the fractional optima to the LP relaxation. And as a result, now we have a unique uh, solution, which is integer. So we solve these integer programs using the cutting planes. So this is how the Gomery's cutting plane method uh, generally proceeds. And, uh, you know, the way we discussed it, we added one inequality at a time and we essentially resolved the corresponding LP obtained using a new cut from scratch. So because it was a two variable problem, this was easy to do graphically. So this was not a problem for this small example. However, what do you do in general? So once you add an extra inequality, obviously you don't want to resolve the whole LP from scratch. You want to take advantage of the previously optimal basis. And this is what we typically do in practice. Uh, because when we add a cut, what happens, the previously optimal solution is not feasible anymore. And, you know, you cut off this basic optimal solution. And uh, now you need some starting point to continue with the simplex iterations. But as we well know, we can switch to the dual problem and uh, the previously optimal basis is still going to be feasible for the dual problem. And therefore, what we do in practice, usually we switch to the dual simplex and we find a new optimal solution, hopefully with very few iterations of the dual simplex. So uh, let's illustrate the idea using the last cut that we generated. So I copied the derivations uh, from the two slides before. So we started by writing down the expression for x2 as the basic variable. And then what we did, we rounded down the coefficients for the non-basic variables. And then we rounded down the right-hand side and we obtained this inequality right here. After that, we got rid of the slack variables in order to be able to show this uh, valid inequality clearly on the graph. When we add this cut to the previously optimal simplex tableau, then first of all, as we always do, we need to eliminate the basic variables. Therefore, we need to get rid of x2 if we are to add this to our simplex tableau. Okay, so how do we get rid of x2? As we always do with simplex, we go back to the row where x2 is basic and express x2 through the rest of the variables from there and substitute for x2 in our inequality. So here we have x2 is equal to 8 thirds minus 1 third s1 plus 4 thirds s4. And uh, we have in this inequality x2 minus 2s4. So we're going to substitute for x2. We'll have uh, 8 thirds minus 1 third uh, s1 plus 4 thirds s4 minus 2s4 is less than or equal to 2. As a result, we obtain minus 1 third s1 minus 2 thirds S4 is less than or equal to minus two thirds, which is the same as one third S1 plus two third S4 is greater than or equal to two thirds. So this is the actual cut that we would add to the currently optimal simplex tableau for the linear programming relaxation of our IP. And now, when we add it to the simplex tableau, we need to subtract the excess variable on the left. And clearly, we cannot use this excess variable as the basic variable for this row because we would have a negative value for it if we did. And this is not surprising because uh, we know that uh, this cut actually removes the previously optimal solution. 
So therefore, by adding this constraint, we don't have a basic feasible solution anymore. But as we mentioned earlier, we can switch to the dual problem and um, we can use the dual simplex to solve uh, the result in LP. The previously optimal basis will be still feasible for the dual even after we add this cut. Alright, so let's actually pay attention to how we obtain these coefficients here for the non-basic variables in the cut that we are adding. So, for the coefficient for S1, for example, it's equal to one-third. And uh, one-third is exactly the fractional part of the coefficient for S1 that we have right here. Then the coefficient for S4 is two-thirds. And two-thirds is, in fact, the fractional part of negative four-thirds. Because what is negative four-thirds? Negative four-thirds, the integer part of this is a negative two. And the fractional part is two-thirds. So, therefore, again, this is the fractional part of this coefficient. And similarly, two-thirds is the fractional part of the right-hand side here. And this is not a coincidence if we take a close look at how we derive this inequality. So essentially, we combine these two expressions here by substituting for x2 in the inequality, we obtain this inequality right here. This can also be viewed as if uh, what we did, we essentially subtracted this inequality from this equality right here. So, and then what is happening? So, looking at the corresponding coefficients, x2, of course, will be eliminated just like we wanted. And then uh, here you have the coefficient for s1, and the coefficient for s1 in the inequality is the integer part of the coefficient for s1 here. So, therefore, when you subtract an integer part of the number from the number, what you get is the fractional part of the number. And this is exactly what we get. Uh, similarly with S4 and the right-hand side. And of course, because we subtract uh, the inequality, the inequality sign will be reversed and we obtain greater than or equal to instead of less than or equal to. All right, now we are ready to write down the Gomery fractional cuts. So this is how we call these cuts uh, written in this form. Gomery's fractional cuts. Uh, let's write it in the general form now. So let's say you solve the LP relaxation for your integer program and um, you obtain a solution that is fractional. So assume that uh, some variable xr is a basic variable that's fractional at the optimum. And then uh, the expression for this basic variable uh, taken from the simplex tableau is given by xr plus the summation of uh, arj's for j in uh, the set of non-basic variables uh, multiplied by xj's equal to the right-hand side, uh, which is given by, uh, say, br bar. So let's use bar here as well because arj's would be the original coefficients uh, that we start with in the original LP and here we are talking about the row for the basic variable xr in the optimal simplex tableau for the LP relaxation. Okay, so what we did to derive the Gomery cuts, we essentially rounded down all of the arj's. So arj's, we can represent them as uh, arj is given by the round down of arj or the floor plus let's denote the fractional part by frj so where frj is essentially the fractional part of a bar rj which is given by arj bar minus the floor of arj bar. So then we essentially replaced arj bars with uh, their rounded down values to obtain the inequality xr 
plus the summation for j in n of a rj bar floors of this times xj is less than or equal to br bar. We also rounded down this as well to obtain the inequality we were looking for. So this is uh, our Gomery cut. So now, uh, how do we obtain the Gomery's fractional cut? We essentially substitute for this variable xr in our cut that we are adding because xr is the basic variable and uh, you know we need to eliminate it uh, from the row that we are adding because it, uh, the basic variable can be present only in one row. And how do we do this? We do this by substituting for xr by obtaining the expression for xr from this row right here which is the basic row for xr and uh, the other way of looking at it, as just we mentioned, you could think of it as subtracting this inequality right here from this equation over here. All right, so when we subtract, what we'll obtain, xr will disappear. And when we subtract the corresponding coefficients for xj's, we'll have the summation of uh, fij's xj's will be greater or equal to, let's denote the fractional value of uh, br bar by uh, fb, uh, let's say. fb, where fb is uh, br bar minus the floor of uh, br bar okay so this is the inequality that we obtain and this is the gomery's dual fractional cut or simply gomery's fractional cut uh, next we are going to consider an example of applying the gomery's cutting plane method to a problem this example will actually involve the simplex tableaus and all the details. All right, so we are looking again at a two variable problem here. In this case, it's a minimization problem with two constraints. And we can see that uh, the optimal solution to the LP relaxation is clearly fractional. So optimal tableau for the LP relaxation is in fact given here. So the value of x1 at the optimal solution is 4 fifth and the value of x2 is 8 fifth. Now we select one of the variables, let's say x2 for generating the cut. And then the way we generate the cut, we essentially look at the non-basic variables, which are x3 and x4 in our case, and we take the fractional values for the corresponding tableau coefficients and uh, we generate this inequality as follows. So you have uh, one fifth essentially is taken from here and this will be the coefficient for x3. Then two fifth, the fractional part of negative three fifth is in fact uh, two fifth. So this is where it goes. So you take the fractional uh, part of each number, right? So because uh, the integer part of negative 3 fifth is negative 1, and you, when you subtract negative 1 from negative 3 fifth, you get exactly 2 fifth. And finally, this is supposed to be greater or equal to the fractional part of the right hand side, and you have the right hand side given by 8 fifth, the fractional part of it is given by 3 fifth. So this gives us the cut, all right? So this is very similar to what we have done uh, before. And now we are going to actually add this cut to the simplex tableau and we'll apply dual simplex method to find the new optimal solution. So we are adding this constraint. So we introduce the new select variable x5, which will be the basic variable for our newly added constraint. Uh, but of course, you have uh, the negative uh, value for this basic variable, and therefore, uh, this basic solution is infeasible for the primal problem. 
However, looking at row 0 of the primal tableau, we see that all the coefficients are non-positive. Therefore, the dual simplex has the feasible basis and we switch to the dual simplex. So we apply the dual simplex iteration to this tableau and we obtain uh, the new tableau which is optimal. So you have here the solution that is also integer. So we have x1 is equal to 2, x2 is equal to 1, x3 is 3 and we obtain the optimal solution in just one cut. And uh, the next slide actually illustrates this graphically. So the cut that we generated, which is 1 fifth x3 plus 2 fifth x4 is greater than or equal to 3 fifth, it can actually be expressed in terms of the original variables x1 and x2 as follows. So after we substitute for the slack variables like we did before, we would obtain the following inequality. And then if we look at it uh, graphically, then we see that with just this one cut, we obtain the optimal solution to our IP. Okay, to conclude, I would like to return to the first example we considered and uh, make a few observations that hold in general for the Gomery's cutting plane method. So here at this step, we saw that when we added the cut 3x1 plus 5x2 less than or equal to 20, it did cut off some of the fractional optimal solutions, but not all of them. In fact, if we didn't switch to the variable x2 and didn't generate the cut corresponding to x2, perhaps we could continue generating cuts of this sort that would take you a little bit closer to the optimal solution and would cut off some of the fractional solutions a little bit at a time. But how do we know that it will not last infinitely long? So this is one of the issues that you can have with uh, this cutting plane approach. So another issue, just before we generated this cut, we observed that we had infinitely many optimal solutions here and one of them was integer. So if I did the right iteration of the simplex method, I could have ended up in this integer solution and there wouldn't be even a need to generate this cut right here, right? So essentially what this shows is that uh, there are a couple of important considerations that need to be carefully considered when we design a cutting plane algorithm. So the first one is uh, we saw that the simplex steps, uh, the way you do the pivots, have implications on which solution you're going to get, of course, right? So therefore, you need to have a strategy on uh, how do you do the simplex pivots. So that's one thing. The other thing is in cases when you have multiple fractional basic variables in your optimal solution to the LP relaxation, you need to decide which one you're gonna use to generate the Gomery's cut based on next, all right? And in fact, Gomery has shown that if you apply certain lexicographic rules for the simplex pivots and for the choice of the variable that you use to generate the cut, then the method is guaranteed to converge in a finite number of steps. <laughs>